So welcome everyone and thanks for being here. Uh, I think there was a lot of competition and other very interesting talks right now, but really appreciate it. Uh, we decided to come here. Um, we will talk again after uh, an amazing talk about containers, again about containers in FreeBSD. Uh, hot topic of the day. Um, because the previous talk was already about what is a container, I will be very fast on that. Uh, I also have a slightly different view, uh, but we will talk about uh, kind of thing. Um, what is part and what we reach so far. Um, and then I have a couple of um, provocative thoughts about how to move forward and what are, in my opinion, some uh, non-technical obstacles that we are facing to reach the next point. Who am I? Uh, name is Luca Pizzamiglio, complicated last name. Uh, here is my, I'm previously port committer since 2017. Um, and yeah, reach out to me for any additional questions. This is my uh, email address. Uh, working at it for, I don't know, 25 years now. Um, but yeah, what is a container? Uh, do you have any easy, I mean, what is, in your, in your opinion, a container? Good. I mean, we already know your, your uh, but what is a container? If I ask you, okay, someone asking your, your, your partner, or whatever, I have a container, what is it? It's your sandbox. Uh, hopefully secure sandbox. Secure sandbox. Interesting. Right, right. Uh, there's a network or allow it to only some amount of RAM, things like that. An isolation, isolated environment yep. to, to run stuff. Okay. Um, yep. Yeah, I'm not asking property, that's really what is it? I mean, okay, it's self-contained, but it is an isolated environment. If I ask you, okay, what is it? Yeah, it's, a, it's a subsystem where you can do your stuff, get rid of your documents and stuff. Like a box of nuts, for example. You can use a nut, you throw it away. A sort of, you know, it's a sort of sandbox. Yeah. But basically, you can... It doesn't have to be a sandbox. It can't talk to other... It can't sit next to other containers on the shelf. That's not a problem. Okay. It doesn't have to be a sandbox, but it has to have a specific purpose. Well, the purpose is that you should be able to get rid of them. So, really, some okay, something you can have multiple of them and get rid of them. Um, so, the first, I mean, there are very different definitions. Uh, main problem is there is no standard definition for a container. Nobody defines a container. It's not like uh, POSIX with processes, there is no very nice definitions. Container is a naive, uh, not naive, uh, not well defined concept. Everyone tends to see container on what they work on. Um, there is the community, a lot of focus on the runtime part of the containers. Um, if you read the definition in the Docker uh, website, that tells you that the container is a way to distribute applications with a lot of focus on application. A, they even see this as a kind of a replacement for package management. Um, it was today in the, in the, in the talk, uh, um, in the keynote, he said, oh, Docker enabled what? Oh, I'm a developer. I have a dependency as a subsystem. Uh, I need in my local environment this authentication application, whatever it is nowadays with all those microservices. I just allow the Docker container, it runs, and the authentication application that in my company is there. So I installed, double double quote, an application to a container. That is somehow what. Um, Docker somehow put in mind, and the focus was developer at first. So containers somehow um, created a bridge between developers and operations um, as, okay, I don't give you the source code, you build it and you deploy it, I give you an image with my application and you deploy it. I, it's already built, it's already there. It just somehow moved the focus. So a container can be seen as a way to distribute an application, and has two main factors, an image and a runtime. It's not just the runtime. A lot of the answers were focused on the runtime because in our community there is a lot of focus in the runtime and also the cool stuff is in the runtime. Or security, isolation, uh, properties, and nobody has focused on the image. That actually is the first thing that you have to do to distribute your application, your code. Any 
additional to uh, thoughts about it. I mean, there is more or less an accepted, in my, in my opinion, uh, acceptable definition. Uh, zoom a little bit out from the typical runtime part. And that is also why the OCI specification actually contains two specifications, one from the runtime and one for the, for the, for the image. You cannot live without them. So there are two basically. You can see, in my opinion, the best parallel is the image is the program, the runtime is the application, is the process. So if you see container as one single application, I think the analogies between process and, and program, container basically means both. So there is no precise nomenclature, but the container image is your program and the container runtime is the process. Just to give some idea. What is part? So back in the day, uh, I saw people using Docker. I was really jealous. I mean, it's so easy to, sp oh, I don't have to download different. The problem with Nginx, different versions, I cannot install on previously different version of Nginx. It's only the package that there's only one. Oh, but you can use Docker. Uh, no, I cannot. And basically, it allows you to do many nice things, uh, this container world. And there is none, nothing of this kind of support for, for FreeBSD. So I'll just say, but FreeBSD has a lot of cool technologies in it. J is the first one. Um, what is missing to FreeBSD to have a container-alike framework? So I decided this project as educational project and um, yeah, to prove that FreeBSD was container-ready somehow. Um, so that was the choice was to use test scripts only. Um, because it means that I don't have to write additional complicated features. Everything is already there. So I just use the utilities that are there as a way to prove that there is everything is already available. Started in November 2017 and somehow is still progressing, um, still living in a way. Um, if you ask yourself what is pod, basically pod is heavily based on jails. Um, I'm focusing only on the at the beginning, there was a lot of confusion. Uh, was this a naive approach? So we just say, oh, we can have an easy jail kind of approach. We can have a single data set. I'm only focusing on the container-like um, framework, meaning that what is a huge, unique, uh, let's say, uh, ZFS data set with everything that you need. Base, packages, application, configuration, everything that you need is basically part of the, uh, of the image. To create uh, an image in an automated way, uh, just add a support for, for scripts, usually what you need. Um, and the problem, as I said, oh, it's, there are many other um, frameworks back in the day that were already managing uh, jails. Uh, all of them didn't support images. So we say, okay, what is the naive, the easiest way to, to create an image? Well, you have one ZFS data set, take a snapshot, send, compress, an image. And if you copy that file over, well, you reverse it. You just untar, um, you just extract it, ZFS receive, and you get the, and then you can clone it. And then you have the image move back and forth. Um, so it was very naive, working a, a solution. So uh, still using that. Um, the focus was are also on a couple of different areas of the typical jails usage. Uh, the one was to have not persistent jails. Uh, for instance, in your cage, oh, only a person, back in the day, I remember I was talking with developers, I say, no, we only uh, support persistent jails because of the problem we already saw. If they just, just stop, is the command that is executing uh, pre and post hooks and is doing all the cleanup operations. Jails is a structure inside the kernel if the jail disappears, there is no way to hook outside and run postal script. You have to run it directly on. If we only want to run a process in each jail, uh, uh, the jail will disappear and the process will run in future condition of one. So the question was about, yeah, uh, not using uh, RSC. RSC basically as something, but that was the other area of focus. Uh, so we wanted to have. We currently, a lot of them, a lot of those frameworks focus on using jails as light virtual machines. So you have a subsystem running its own cron job, running its own cron D, uh, syslog D, and so on. So basically uh, replicating a typical full system, or at least uh, narrowed down, but is a system, is not an application, 
um, the idea was to, okay, what if you only want to run one process, not many? Uh, and there was kind of not too much there. So the RC in FreeBSD uh, is jail aware. So when you have your Mimic there, it's running few services. The services are aware that you are in a jail or not. We want to skip that entirely. Just run, okay, we want to run Nginx, not RC with Nginx start. We just want to strip down everything and focus only on one application. The reason why is um, container best practices says a container contains one process only, not multiple process. It's a best practice. You can do it, but usually it's a source of pain. Um, if you imagine, for instance, if you have, um, this is the concept of pod in Kubernetes. Pod is multiple containers, and you have a containers running your application, but then you have another, for instance, running a, an exporter, and another, uh, do anything else, but the product, you have multiple containers sharing something in between, and that's container pods, but you have separated containers. If one container dies, you will need to restart everything. You only restart the single container that died, and everything will start with its footer. But uh, if the application itself starts up from the system, it's not one right? So if the application if has... So multi-process application usually are a very bad idea in containers. You, um, the container idea is to exploit horizontal autoscaling, not vertical autoscaling. So it means that you have a you, um, um, if you have performance issue, you scale horizontally the same stuff, but you don't make the single unit more performant. So basically, you want to have this so-called horizontal scaling, and you put just in parallel multiple stuff if you can. Um, would you also apply this to parking demons like Postgres? Parking demon? Um, yes. Uh, if, we'll talk about that later. Uh, because exactly with Nomad, this is a problem. You shouldn't fork anything. You should keep the, 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 the shell where you're running it. Um, yeah, no fork. A little bit of uh, runtime. So basically, the choice is that. Um, with. Obviously, we used everything that was available in FreeBSD, so jails. Um, not only, it, there was, I think, a KubeCon, where basically there was some sort of, you know, the history of containers, and they declare that jails was the first container idea that was come, uh, came out to the world. So actually, there was some sort of, that, oh, jails is obviously the natural, the natural way to, to implement containers, but also was somehow the first idea of having this kind of containerized environment. So using jail was obviously um, a no-brainer. Surrounding that, there was a lot of other stuff, like RCTL, we want to have um, resource limitation. Um, we use VNet for network. We'll talk about network a bit more uh, later. Uh, Bridges, PF, everything that is basically there. Opinionated choices. Uh, I remember the first issue that I got in, in part was, oh, can you support IPFW? Uh, no, I mean, not sure welcome, but it's a lot of work. So I just decided to use PF, but it's just a choice because I knew how PF works. Um, but as usual, not sure welcome. So if you want to support other firewalls, just do. Um, Network. So it's a lot of opinable and bad choices when it comes to network. Uh, I'm not a very, I'm not very strong in network. So I pick basically what it was working. Uh, and we had basically four different network setups. Everything that Jay was providing was just a no-brainer to make it available outside. So inherit you inherit the stack of the machine. Cool. Typically, it's good if you if you have process that needs to fetch from from outside, not to expose network services. Uh, alias is that other typical way. You just put an alias on on the network card, and then you attach to a jail. Uh, and then we developed a couple of things using the bridge. The bridge is a way to create an internal network that is completely internal and virtual, and then and uh, completely detached. And the idea is to use um, PF to provide um, connectivity to the outside. A little bit more later. Um, then, if you have a lot of jails, they share the same bridge. There could be some performance issues. So we also added the ability to have a private bridge. That means, OK, you can create smaller, basically, bridges where you have fewer um, jails that communicate to, to, um, to each other to just reduce 
uh, potential um, bottleneck on, on the bridge. The problem was to decide which IP every machine had. That was some sort of static DHCP uh, kind of. So that's why I uh, developed a small application just to manage this IP address space there to. Um, Sorry. No problem. Um, so that was the one of the few additions that we had to do, but it's just to manage the IP address space. It's not really needed per se, um, but yeah, something that was somehow needed. The latest addition is one of the latest addition is support of multiple IP stacks. Um, it's easy with JS to have IPv6. Uh, it's less easier to have a an environment where you can try IPv6 addresses. That is not usually so easy. Uh, but the idea was to have IPv4, IPv6, and dual stack. If the host machine obviously is supporting IPv6, you can give IPv6 to your JS. You cannot have the other way around, uh, for obvious reasons. And yeah, few choices. Um, so as I said before, the, the IPv4 implementation, basically you have a bridge where all JS lives. You just put um, the default gateway address on the bridge, and then you just configure PF um, to do the NAT for the outbound traffic, and then you add uh, dynamically uh, redirect rules for the inbound traffic. So if your service is exposing a network service, then you can uh, basically create um, a redirection rule to use the, the network interface of the host to connect your services there. So you have the redirection there. Um, and the IPv4 is fully isolated. You define basically which IP address to use, and then you will just use everything. And this is a network that is not visible at all from outside. Um, the idea there was to have a, some sort of you know, Docker-like experience. Oh, run on my laptop. I don't know in which network I'm going to attach. So managing the addresses of everything all the time was kind of you cannot do it, it's complicated, so I want to basically remove from the user this burden and I say, okay, you just, just give me a range that is never conflicting. The default is basically 10.192, this is the default, but you can change it. Um, and then, you know, all the machines live in this virtual network that hopefully is not conflicting with anywhere else where you are. Uh, and fully extracted, fully isolated, works pretty well and automatically managed by pods so you don't have to no PF, how it works, and it works just fine. On a PV6, it's, uh, um, I didn't know how to proceed. So I just asked people, uh, and said, come on, you, I mean, PV6, you don't do NAT and redirection. I mean, it's so IPv4. I mean, IPv6 is there to avoid those kind of things. So you don't do that. You just attach directly your jails to the network. This is how you do it on a PV6. Cool. Went through um, this idea fully. So on IPv6, you have a different bridge only for IPv6, because what it did is say, okay, you take the network card, you just put it in the bridge, and then your JS will just get the address from, from the network with the uh, uh, RTSOL. So basically just get some uh, unsolicited request, oh, and then start configure. You don't have to do anything. Several problems with this approach. Um, the network card goes in promiscuous mode, because then every jail has, using VNet, they have their own MAC address. With VLAN, if you run on uh, on a Wi-Fi, well, you only receive the traffic for for your net MAC address. So this doesn't work on your laptop. It works if you have a network, a physical network card with a PV6, and you attach them. It works just fine. But it's run basically in promiscuous mode. It has to basically read all the traffic to just to capture the traffic that is defined for for the jails. Well, why would that be so much of a problem if you have a switched network? Unless you overload it with the TCAM and the top of switch. Um, it's not a problem. As I said before, I'm very bad with network compared to the average and uh, any BSD conference. So this is an area of improvement. Um, we'll talk a bit more, more later because also this is not a very good idea. Uh, patches are welcome. So be free. Do you have any, I mean, I'm happy it really is. It's really improvable. Um, but what we did later, so the idea um, it was to develop part only to imitate Docker, so to focus only on the container uh, kind of features and not to care about the orchestration. Um, 
but then at a certain point, you're like, oh, but yeah. yeah. Orchestration is the way to go nowadays. It's so um, back in the days, we look at Nomad. Nomad is an open source container orchestrator. It's a sort of competitor to Kubernetes, uh, developed by the AshiCorp. The big, biggest um, uh, advantage of Nomad is that Nomad is, from the beginning, designed to run on different operating systems. AshiCorp has a lot of enterprise um, customers. They run you know, on Solaris, on other stuff. So there was already a Nomad port on, on FreeBSD, so I didn't have to do anything. Oh, Nomad is there. So basically, you can run Nomad on FreeBSD already. Kubernetes, forget about it. It doesn't compile. I mean, it's, 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 it's a nightmare. But for, for Nomad, AshiCorp care about having Nomad running on multiple operating systems. So uh, being not one operating system centric is one of their things. So it's already somehow designed to be more flexible. Um, what you have to do if you have a different container type, you just create a driver. You basically expose the features that Nomad needs to schedule or to start basically a container. And that's it. So my former colleague, uh, Esteban, just wrote a driver. Wrote a driver for Nomad to interact with Pod. And yeah, you have a Kubernetes-like experience. What it means, very high level. I don't want to spend too much time on that. But basically, you define some sort of job that is Nomad names. You specify, specify what kind of service, other details like where the image is, and so on. Um, and for instance, you can say, oh, I want two instances of that service. What happened is those are those in the middle are different uh, nomad worker, kind of. Specifically, if you choose, oh, this is a, a pot thing, so I want to, um, you need this has to have the driver to speak to. So let's say this is some sort of the control plane where you decide what to run and so on, and those are the worker. And what you can have, you know, multiple nodes, then you can have multiple instances of your stuff. Uh, I put the IP addresses just to verify the IPv4 on the bridge. So basically, this is the internal virtual network, the 192, blah, blah, blah. And they can have all of them the same IP. Who cares? Because there is PF here that do all the translation. What it matters is the IP of the machine, because the service is not reachable from here, but it's reachable from here. Nobody is an orchestrator. It doesn't manage the service catalog is console, on the other side, is basically another service that just managed the service catalog. What it means? It means that, oh, I have two instances. Nomad decides where the instances are running, which port to expose, and so on. And console keep track of those. So if you want to reach Kubar, that is here, you use this IP with this port. And here there is port that is doing, this is injecting those PF rules on the fly. Uh, and do all the magic to make the FUBAR service running in a jail exposed outside. This is the cloud wave of services. Um, additionally, you can have ingress, that is basically some sort of load balancer, uh, to dynamically uh, understand how to reach a service. You have only, only one single point of uh, entry. And you say, oh, for instance, in um, Minipod, there is some sort of reconfigured system. Uh, traffic is configured to have one front end. Uh, depending on the host header, decide, oh, you, if your host header is FUBAR, it's looking for the service FUBAR. Traffic is speaking with console to see who is implementing the service FUBAR, and then is redirecting accordingly. So the list of the backend is automatically um, updated all the time. When you do a new deployment and the port number changes and so on, traffic will update uh, the list of backends automatically. And this is the Kubernetes-alike uh, environment. And it works. We have it up and running. Um, the problem is you need to know more or less how Nomad and console work, all those kind of services, to be proficient on that. Uh, because it's, it's a different world, and it can be complicated. but. Um, Problem was with images, we needed a repo for the image. The image was very naive. I didn't want to write a register because I say security issues over everywhere. 
Problem is, oh, you download random stuff, I mean, binary from the internet and you run on your system. Bad idea, usually. Uh, so I didn't want to have this burden. You know, it's an additional thing. You need authentication, ugh, too much. I'm not an expert, I will do disasters there. I'm already doing bad stuff here. So uh, don't make my position worse. Uh, but Stefan like an hour said, well, I can do it, uh, just as a proof of concept. There is disclaimers everywhere. Use it at your own risk, whatever. But at least there is something just to play with. Um, so in, um, there is a um, repository where you can create your, your flavors. And then this system basically will just create images for you for different FreeBSD versions and so on. Um, there are also additional, for every image, there are already predefined command line how to use and download this image. Uh, so it's some sort of Docker hub for plot images. That was the uh, ambitious goal. Still, with a heavy disclaimer, at your own risk. At the end, the register URL is just a web server downloading a file. Because the image, as we said before, only contains the, 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 the archive. We put some attributes in the name because naive implementation. So, oh, which previous version is it? Oh, if it is underscore 12, or the, not a great implementation, for sure not OCI. But that was something to basically move on and prove the concept. So that was an additional work done by Stefan. And how far this naive implementation reached. Um, one of the problems when you run containers in production is, oh, this container is misbehaving. I need, the developers need to S uh, SSH into that. So you don't SSH in containers. What you can do usually, oh, I need a shell in that container that is basically equivalent. So in a jail, what you have to do? Oh, you have to go to the developer. The developer needs to access the machine, needs to run uh, a shell with JXX inside the jail. A lot of permission in between. Uh, and you have to be root to run JXX. So similar issues with, in general, container world. Uh, Nomad provide a UI. Um, and there is very nice addition. This is the last addition, so how far we reached. Uh, you can run directly from the web UI a comment in the pod directly. What it means, there is a nice screenshot because the demo didn't work, so the backup was <laughs> having a screenshot. Uh, what it means is this is the web UI. There is somewhere a, uh, a JS is running on some machine, but from the control plane, basically here there's a, oh, nomad, alloc, exec, whatever, and what do you want to exec? SH. And directly from the control plane, you reach the jails, and you have an SH running there. This is the latest achievement. So how far, in my opinion, also a naive implementation can go? Because the interface between the normal pod driver and pods is a bunch of shell scripts. Uh, running shell scripts in production, can make me nervous, so that's why I don't have any interest in it. But uh, I said, um, Grebo, um, Grebo at FreeBSD uh, is another pod committer. Uh, he has a professional, I mean, instance of this system running on um, what it works. So basically, there is something in production, uh, even though he has a different network setup, so it's a patch version of pod, still waiting to understand how he did things. He's better than me, so. Uh, we need to figure out a way to improve network, but for sure, um, his contribution was great because it moved from a proof of concept to something, I would say, semi-production ready. Um, and basically, he needed this kind of features implemented in pods and then in the driver deployed working. Moving to a little bit more, I would say, less technical thing. Why pot reached this level? Um, was not just me. It's a community effort. Esteban wrote the writer, Grembo, Aka, Michael, uh, ran a class in a professional environment. So it just identified a lot of corner cases. We talked about Postgres. Huge amount of issues. Um, the the, the POSIX shared memory, uh, shared memory is not cleaned up. I mean, many, many corner cases has to be found and addressed. Um, he has a very also additional use case for bad jobs. 
uh, when a batch of die, you cannot, oh, we need to know how if it was successful or not. So we had to add comments to know what was the, the state of the job when died. Uh, because it's not an effort service, it's a different thing. Um, Stefan step in and you know create registry with pre-built images. Um, and then also very good because you reach out every every quarter say, hey, you should write something, otherwise I will just forget. Uh, so it's really a community effort. Everyone just contributed in their in their corner, and uh, we can we could basically move on. Move on with what? Layered images. So basically, oh, we use ZFS, so we just create an hierarchy of images. We are still imitating OCI somehow, but redefine everything is a lot of work. So, oh, we, ha we found you know, a way to do it. Uh, DNS configuration. If you download, we have the DNS is configuration, you know, the, the rest of conf is part of the container. Well, adding comments basically to change the DNS configuration on the fly because you don't know where your machine is going to run. So you have to basically strip away some of the configuration of the image when it was created to make it more agnostic. We decided just to overwrite things on the fly when the things are, are prepared. But still, a lot of work. Um, flavors at the beginning was less flexible, so now you can just isolate your flavors somewhere and you're creating stuff directly from there. I was talking about, yeah, fuzzy shared memory. Add this garbage collector because, oh, the J is not dying. Why? There is nothing there. Oh no, there is a positive shared memory. Um, and also the nice thing, fixing current. So um, those use cases when it comes out and you, you speak with people and they're willing to fix it. So now in current, J's are able to clean up shared memory, uh, positive shared memory. So it's a nice two ways collaboration. So if you have use cases, people reach out and things get better. Um, the, the, that is the example the ZFS encrypted uh, data set. So basically, everything that is available from the operating system, it's just a matter of exposing a bar. You don't have to do, a lot. I mean, it's already done. The, community, the operating system is developing. You have to just bring those features uh, up and make them available. This is the nightmare. Starting and stopping a jail is not an atomic operation. Damn it. You can, if you are, um, especially if you don't control it because nobody is controlling what is starting and not, it can start the same JS twice, just few millisecond, microsecond. Per, they, I mean, the operation to start the jail with pot specifically, oh, you have to mount the file system, prepare the file system, prepare the network stuff, and then finally start the jail. So there are a lot of operations in between. It's not atomic. And because it's a shared script, it just do stuff on the way, it just check, oh, the jail is existing, no. Yeah, but there is another process that is starting the jail, doing everything already, and then you have race condition like hell. Um, and fixing in shell, so the limitation of the initial choices, not very great. Um, and then some update also on the normal pod driver, as said, bad jobs, periodic bad jobs, another bad thing. Ability to send signals, exec and so on, just because the idea was, oh, you need it, you implement it here, and then you expose it, and then no one can use it, so. Um, still, few issues. Um, the redirection, if you use the host IP directly from the host, and you do the redirection, it just doesn't work, because when you are on a machine, we just saw before, the if you are here, 10.0.0.3, if you ping 10.0.0.3, well, it's local loss because you don't go to the physical network. Uh, somehow the redirection, if you try to reach FUBAR using this address, uh, basically the one that is in, in console, it's not working. The traffic stops when it goes back from, from the jail. Uh, get lost in between because it's local loss of the network, I don't know, there is something that doesn't work. We have a workaround that is horrible, uh, really bad. Um, and yeah, Michael said, oh, I have this patch version that uses reflect jail, but it's really, I don't know what it is. So he knows, he has very, we will, we will integrate these solutions here uh, one day. Um, we have ability to mount stuff inside the jail. We use NullFS heavily, uh, but the typical Docker usage, oh, I just mount a file mount a file, uh, if you 
let me use this uh, word, we cannot do it, we have to copy it. Uh, you cannot mount a file only, you have mount point is a folder, it cannot be a file. Um, and that is somehow a limitation. Currently, oh, you just, you need a, a folder with one file, and that is the workaround. Yes? Sorry? Uh, no, maybe. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think there are workarounds to do that. Uh, it would be nice to just use the same approach for everything, let's say in this way, to, to limit the, the variability. Something is possible, yeah. Um, but yeah, there's, if you have uh, better ideas, just write to me and I will try to use, I mean, using Fuse, just add more uh, dependencies, I'm not super, but. Yeah, they're just for the, for the, uh, yeah, one workaround is to use, yeah. Uh, that if it's, uh, yeah, that is the current workaround. So using a folder and put the file there and you can, the problem also with, we have to always pay a lot of attention. That's in general, Dan Langell uh, gave a good, uh, a good uh, examples. If you start to abuse symlinks, uh, then, I mean, how we copy now stuff is to, if you want to copy a file, we mount the folder in the jail, we run the copy inside the jail when everything is mounted. And the reason is, if you have um, team link with uh, absolute path name, if you are in the host or you are in the jail, those things are resolved differently. So to avoid confusion, we just, oh, you want to copy a file? We mount all the file systems so you run the copy in the correct environment and then it goes back. Um, yeah, that is another thing. The point is we want to be able to do it without running the jail. You don't want to execute the jail just to copy a file in it. So we have separated you, we have basically a way to mount, to prepare the file system only just to copy the file and goes back. Um, this is another topic, it's not just for us. I think there is this uh, nasty race conditions that many has been addressed. I mean, it's not that bad as before, it was really addressed. The problem with VNet and jails is when you stop the jail and then you immediately destroy the, the VNet, uh, the e -pair. So basically, e -pair B needs to go out and in that moment, um, if you destroy the jail, then the, the jail is removed. There is sometimes some race condition that happen and it just explodes. Easy solution, oh, we have a sleep. Uh, you destroy the jail, you stop the jail, you wait a little bit, and then you destroy. Um, I know it's not nice, but it, I mean, it's shell script again. Um, and, but this is, I mean, it's not easy, uh, easy stuff. Um, one big difference compared to the, I say the Linux world is about uh, resource limitation. This is the only, I would say, big difference is about memory limitation. RCTL try to limit the memory used, but it's not that, nasty as C groups, so it doesn't kill the process if you use more memory. Um, so just try to limit the memory use. Uh, C groups is a typical thing, oh, if you have a leak, just kill the process so it doesn't disturb anyone else. Um, yes? But you have to be careful because if you limit the resident memory size too much, you can push the process to start swapping really. Uh, yeah, last time I tried, it wasn't swapping, it was just going above the limits and it wasn't stop swapping at all. Uh, but it was three years ago, so things could have been changed. Uh, uh, I want just to, I think we are running, yeah, five minutes, so I'll, I need to rush a little bit. Um, as said, initial uh, assumption was a lot of source of pain, so um, ideally we would like to have OCI support, uh, lifecycle support, that is the same thing, the same struggle, um, J's are a kernel, an in-kernel data structure. So to have an interaction with the user space, you need some sort of supervisor that can keep track of the status of the, of the jail to be able to automate the different operations. Uh, because the kernel cannot, hey, run this post stop hook 
and not do it. So you need something outside to, to listen basically to the events and have those kind of uh, managing the lifecycle support. With a Nomad for driver, oh, we've just fixed it. it the driver, the Nomad, is already taking care of the container lifecycle. So I just said, Esteban, yeah, can you run pot stop there every time? So if it doesn't exist anymore, just run spot, yeah. stop, the, stop it twice. Uh, we make stop intelligent enough to not do too much, but at least is able to perform all the cleanup operation, unmounting the file system, things like that. Uh, so that was, uh, but if you're not using Nomad pot driver, you don't clean it up. Um, Another thing you can do with a supervisor, ideally the supervisor has root credentials, so the user can start a container just speaking with the supervisor and you allow basically users to run jails without the needs to be root. If it's a good idea or not, I don't know, but with a supervisor you can do it. Um, I said shell is a lot of fun until it's really not. Um, let's skip this. Last thing is, we need to redesign many of the, uh, of the stuff that we are doing right now because the naive approach of stuff reached basically, in my opinion, its limit. We can, do, we can still do a lot of improvements, uh, but we, they are not game changer. Uh, they, are not, they are not able to now be widely adopted because there are some inherent issues with the initial thought because the goal was completely different. So if you want to go from a proof of concept to a product, we have to address uh, several stuff. And also, it seems that the previous community would like to have a container implementation, but it is a community effort. Cannot be, I mean, why there are 30 jails um, framework and many of them died after one or two years. Uh, if it's only me on Sunday on my couch doing stuff, after a while, you just give up because, you know, life moves on. So it's a community effort. Not just because you cannot rely on one person, but there are so many subsystems. I'm not a jail expert. I'm not a ZFS expert. I'm not a network expert. Manage to do something, but still, if you want to reach a certain point, you need people with better knowledge, with real experience on every subsystem to give you the right hints. I mean, already now we're talking about network, how to map a system. Yeah, just came out. Oh, you can do that. You can do that. You can do that. You can do many things, but I don't know everything. Um, and that is why it's a community effort. And the second reason also is different ways to use a stress <coughs> container. I made the analogy before, program and process. It's really like that. So the, you can use a process in four gazillion ways, uh, and you have three billion of use cases, and I cannot imagine all of them. So you need a community also to, to enrich the use cases and make this more reliable. Um, opinionated, but yeah, we have to get rid of shell and use some programming language that is called programming language, not shell script, that is not a programming language. Uh, provocative, Go seems a natural choice, but I'm rust myself, so uh, just because Go has a gazillion of modules already done for containers, so you don't have to reinvent, or, uh, you know, Docker on ZFS exists, so, oh, we can use that to, for images, or you don't have to do it, so, but uh, we don't have any specific choice. Last but not least, that is the most complicated one, in any possible community, a developer can back to the first thing. Containers for developers, not for operations. Operation was a consequence. If you want a developer to use a container, they have to be able to use it in their own laptop, in their own development environment. Um, here we have few people using uh, BSD directly on laptop, but few already here. Imagine nobody wants to have a free busy laptop just to run jail. So uh, you need to provide an abstraction. Uh, there are several things, but still, it's, yeah. Exactly, but they provide it. So you have, um, yeah, but you have to maintain it, a product for Mac, to allow Mac people to use it. You have to do for Linux, but we are using BSD as a primary driver. You don't want to develop something on Mac that emulates FreeBSD. That is, I would say, the, the a source of friction that is complicated to address because it means that you need developers of another operating system to support your stuff outside. I think this is this is a problem for adoption. Developers don't run FreeBSD natively, period. And if you don't, Docker was successful because they put developers first, 
and then ah, operation they will figure it out that is why it was successful my opinion um, thanks for listening i think we have already a lot of questions i saw a lot of uh, hands i don't know if we have time um so I don't have to repeat it. So if you have questions, just reach the mic and shoot it. Um, so uh, do you have any problem with VNet uh, with any interface that's not ePair? Because my experience is that uh, when I only use uh, gel with a single process, and if you assign a VNet to it, say it is a real network interface, the real network interface will disappear forever after your jail dies. Um, no, we don't have this problem. What we have, we basically to avoid using SH or RC, we have a tiny RC, some sort of script that is created on the fly, depending on the configurations of, of the pod, um, to configure the network on your behalf. So basically we are injecting the configuration in this tiny script and then this script is launching your application. But we never had any issues so far uh, with VNet on, on, I mean, we had in the past, but now it seems, I mean, it seems very, very, very solid. So uh, after that, it's the relocation and knowing which interface you have to destroy after the, the container dies it's still a hard problem because we're using shell script. It's not actually destroyed, it's that the way you need to pass in a real device to the jail, you actually need to use an if config and a VNet yeah. device. The thing is, after uh, the jail die, because it's dead, so you cannot use uh, un un VNet the uh, mm -hmm. interface out from the jail, back to the host. So yeah, we destroy from, from the host. Um, so basically, you know, with EPR, we, we put the B inside the jail and we keep the A outside. Uh, basically hanging there because we have this redirection basically uh, on the bridge so we don't care about the hyper a uh, but then when the jail dies um, we just use some tagging uh, on, on the um, and we try to understand okay which hyper a we need to destroy and then everything is fine so we don't care if the hyper b is not there um, usually everything is fine um, so that is how we we do a lot of operations outside the jail we tend to do as minimum as possible inside the jail and we prepare all the environment that is needed outside and then we start just the process. One thing that I was wanted to mention in Nomad, you cannot fork because then Nomad want to keep the, the, the so basically jail start never ends. And uh, so there is a Nomad lock thing that can just get, grab all the, uh, standard, standard output and standard error and just represent to the web UI. So if, we, if you fork, then uh, it thinks that, oh, the process is not there anymore. It's a typical example with Nginx, for instance, if you check in Docker, uh, they say, oh, the exec oh, Nginx is don't go in background. And you have to do the same for, for, um, for Nginx on, on Nomad. You don't have to go in background, otherwise the, 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 the things doesn't work. But if you run the same image on the command line, it's just still your, 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 your terminal. I think our time is over. Uh, time for lunch. So really thank you for being here.